Hey, welcome back to the Golden Spoon Podcast. I'm McCall. And I'm Jeremy. And today, or this morning, whenever time you're listening, uh, because our guest is from Australia, so in in her area code, it's uh, Tuesday morning. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Carrie Howard is a psychologist, and we're going to talk about uh, trauma prevention, her book, uh, Psychological Injuries, and... and uh, Jeremy actually found out that um, her daughter, and I'm sure she'll talk about this, has bipolar, and Jeremy also has bipolar, so we could probably get into that topic too. So, uh, Carrie, are you there? I am. Thank you. And thank you, McCall, for the great introduction, and thanks, Jeremy, for connecting. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so, uh, wherever you would like to start off, if you want to give a, a brief description of, of how you got into your field. Um, or a little bit of, if you didn't, I mean, it's totally up to you, but the trauma, that one last thing you mentioned before we started recording, that was definitely, I mean, thing yeah, that you said. Yeah, well, because <laughs> what, I, what I explained to you was that um, my belief about mental health is just in general that we need to approach it much more like we do physical health that we recognize that in a physical state especially post pandemic right we know that we can get a virus and we if we look after ourselves properly then we can recover from the virus and you know some people have longer life long things like diabetes that they have to learn to manage and i this is my mission in terms of helping people understand that mental health is the same that we actually have things that can you know set us back for a short period of time or we can have things that are lifelong challenges like bipolar that we need to then learn how to manage um, over the life course and i think if we can start to look at mental health that way and stop seeing it like it's somehow a permanently broken um, mental perspective i think the world would be a better place right Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I, I like how you, you mentioned something about COVID and how, you know, we recognize viruses and everyone's kind of more in keen to that and something that got brought to my mind. I don't know how, how Australia was during the pandemic, but over here, everyone like followed suit. We all wore masks. We shut down when we needed to and everything. And it's like, we all fell in line, but it's, why is it so hard for someone to understand that, that having depression is just the same as having a cold or a broke foot? Like I can't tell my depression to go away just like you can't tell your bone to heal itself. Exactly. And I think this is one of the challenges that we've got because um, I don't know if you saw it, but Prince Harry did a, a special with Oprah um, talking about, you know, mental health and some of the challenges. And he made a comment that sticks in my mind. And it's really where he said, you know, because mental, that because the mental health side of things is inside somebody's mind, excuse me, <clears throat> you can't see it. And so we we can't fix what we can't see is the general, you know, consensus that seems to come. And, you know, we see it in all areas of our society, like, you know, oh, well, insurance companies, for example, will put a, an exclusion on all mental health if you've ever had any mental health challenge without really understanding that, some of those mental health challenges might be temporary and that each episode is is a discrete episode in any case and you know anybody's prone to having difficulties that will throw their mental health into disarray for a period of time but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the right to access things like everybody else does just because the everybody else didn't tell their doctor about how they were feeling when they were feeling it doesn't mean that they didn't experience the mental challenge at some point yeah so what does that do when they put that on insurance or or whatever it may be in uh australia what does that do if you know they stamp you with a, a mental illness what does that do as far as like insurance wise insurance wise or just things they won't cover or yeah. Well, this is something that I'm actually dealing with myself at the moment because um, there's been a bit of a challenge in my working life and I ended up uh, walking away from my situation in November mm -hmm. because I had income protection. And I had income protection if I was unable to work in my professional career in terms of seeing clients face to face one on one as a psychologist. So I'm no longer a registered psychologist in Australia because and there's a lot of 
to do with the regulation that I won't bore you with. But <laughs> yeah. In essence, the income protection insurance has now been denied because they decided that they were going to exclude me from ever making any mental health claim because I have diagnosed ADHD, which is a developmental disorder. It's not actually, you know, it doesn't give me any higher risk factor for, um, you know, a psychological injury. And so I'm fighting them on that at the moment. But as you know, when if you, your mental sort of state is a bit flat, it's very difficult to find the energy to fight. And so it's, it's been a really interesting kind of challenge for me. And I, I started two weeks ago, actually, I posted a video talking about the challenges that I'd had and what had led me to this point and talking about self-stigma because it's actually what I recognized was it was self-stigma that was stopping me from actually letting people know what I was doing because my brain went straight into, but I'm, I've got a new book that's just coming out. Well, it's out now. Um, but I needed to, you know, look at consulting into organizations and these sorts of work opportunities. And then I said, but what will happen if they see that I've, I've had a period of difficulty in my mental health. Oh my goodness. Then they might not give me any work. I need to work, therefore I don't want to tell everybody what's really going on. But in the end, I went to see my hairdresser and we were having this conversation about the things that have been going on in my life the last few months. And she just looked at me and she said, oh my goodness, Kerry, but if you can't talk about it, who could? Yeah. And I went, oh, okay, yep, you're right. <laughs> I have to start <laughs> talking about it a bit more openly. It's... It's challenging, but I think it's it's time that we started normalizing mental health. Oh, yeah. I 100% agree. That's what kind of where, I mean, I've been diagnosed now for, uh, well, first run in with like a mental institution was when I was 25. So eight years ago and then diagnosed yeah. at 27. Um, so five years now. And. I just now probably within the last, I don't know, maybe year to two years, somewhere in there, get starting to be more open about, you know, my bipolar, you know, my bipolar and what happened or, you know, even people around in my workplace. Cause here, I mean, we're in Alabama here in the States and for Alabama, uh, I don't know how many other States are this way in the U S but just for Alabama, it's an at will state. So they can literally just walk in tomorrow and fire me for no reason. I mean, they don't have to, it don't have to be for my mental right. health, but if they heard that I had bipolar, then they can use that, you know, they could say, Oh, well, we need to get rid of that guy. Let's say, you know, he was late too many times or something and fire, you know, they don't ever have to prove that, you know, you're a bad employee or anything. That you did anything wrong. Yeah. So I've always been and hesitant about that. Yeah. Which is fair enough. But, you know, from an insurance perspective, as an example, and, and this is, what happens in Australia, part of the reason why I've just written a new book, which is called How to Heal a Workplace, is because the impact of um, the insurance process in Australia, I felt was really ineffective. But, you know, I look at the States and it's 10 times worse. Um, and that's a real challenge because at a time that we're trying to educate the broader public that this is a very normal thing that happens to all human beings at different points in time. It just depends on whether or not it has a prolonged and significant impact on you or if it's just a short term, you know, limiting impact. When you have things like bipolar, you know, you really need an employer who understands the things that will, you know, help you maintain a good positive sort of attitude most of the time and, and get on top of things, but also allow you to have those opportunities to say today's really not a good day and I really can't I yeah. really can't manage it today and I can't push myself past all of you know what I'm feeling and you know with my daughter that was one of the more challenging things was that she hadn't been able to work for a long time she was first diagnosed at 18 so and but she had had issues right through from late primary school she was depressed right through her teen years and 
you know, but it started much earlier. And this is actually something that I know now, anecdotally from my own work with people who have bipolar, is that it's very common, the first depressive episodes actually usually at the end of primary school. But we don't ever then put those people into um, a pathway of support and early intervention, which is what they should get because we don't diagnose bipolar until they're 18 and they have a major manic episode to offset the depression and then we can see the pattern. But really there are some things that we do understand even physically about what happens with people with bipolar. They've usually always got immune system challenges. So they're often the ones that have had their tonsils out, their appendix out, like all of these different physical challenges because their immune system seems to operate differently as well. But there's a lot more research obviously that needs to be done about some of those things. They're just the things that I know have been reported to me that are quite consistent. Um, yeah, that's, but, it, I mean, we're, know, I think, we're constantly evolving with stuff like that, like with bipolar and then uh, one of my children, you know, had, uh, I guess can still have some symptoms or characteristics of it, but uh, had SPD, sensory processing disorder. You know, I think at two years old, I believe. Um, and that's something that's just here recently been founded, I guess, or, and, you know, they've actually been focusing more on. And here, luckily, it was provided by the state. You know, they sent uh, two different therapists out. Like one, I think hers was touch, uh, it was touch, hear, and taste, I want to say. But anyway, they sent therapists like straight yeah. to the house and worked with us for like a whole year and everything. And it was great. It's interesting though, isn't it, when you think about it, because the sensory the sensory challenges sit more on that autism side of things, which we consistently perceive as a disability. Yet on the bipolar side of things, the I think that there are elements of it that are absolutely gifts your ability to get creative and your ability to think differently and outside the box in comparison to other people. It's a superpower really when you can get it under control and when you can manage the offset against the periods of low mood. Carrie? So there's a lot of support provided on one side and not on the other, I think. Right. When you said the that it's a superpower and, you know, you you can use it to, you know, better yourself, know your advantages and, and uh, know what you're great at. Jeremy, when we first decided to talk on a you know and like do the golden spoon and make up this idea uh you know and get um people on you know focusing on your mental health and your personal growth jeremy was like i see mental health as that you know could potentially be somebody's superpower because they don't have the same mindset as you and me or you don't have the same mindset as the person next yeah, to you. That's what I described to yeah. your fan or yeah, your sister and stuff was that, I mean, that's how I, I try to describe it to some people. I was like, bipolar is kind of like having a superpower while constantly trying to cage a demon at the same time. <laughs> like, well, like <laughs> yes. Carrie said, I mean, as long I, I as you're, that. yeah, as I long think, as you get it under control analogy. and you're medicated and you have a plan and you're seeing your therapist and you have it all managed, everything's good and it's great. And you're right. You are creative. I can sit and paint and draw. I can come up with all crazy ideas. You can ask my call. Like I got my kids' <laughs> bed suspended like from the ceiling and everything. And just like total. But once again, if I mess any of that routine up or mess up my sleep any or something or not enough sleep, then it all gets out of whack. And if it gets too far out of whack, it's a hospital visit, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my daughter was much the same up until um, I found a new treatment um, and this was, she's now 27, so um, I think she was probably about 20 when we first started. So you may have heard of transcranial magnetic stimulation. No. I have not. No. <laughs> okay. So there are places in the US that I know that you can have it, but it just sort of depends um, on what sort of insurance and stuff I think that you've got. Um, but she started having TMS um, about, yeah, about 20, I think she was. And um, I was having to send her to the hospital 
um, where we lived they had no TMS clinic so I had to send her down to Melbourne uh, so she would go into the hospital as an inpatient uh, for four to six weeks and she would have TMS five days out of seven um, but after it only took I want to say two years of her doing that maybe three times a year and then she was in a position where she was able to go back to school and she went back to school to study post COVID and 18 months later became a pastry chef yeah. uh, so that appeals to all of her creativity side but she's also extremely talented and because the school was aware of her um, bipolar there's supports in place she has a, a service dog he goes he was at school with her all the time he goes to work with her every day um, and that helps to keep a lot of her mood stuff stable but she's also worked out that having a focus in her day and a place that she needs to be and all of these obligations has actually helped her to manage her mental health much better she knows she needs downtime on the weekends and so she set up how the she knows now which you know when she needs to relax a bit more what are the sorts of things that help her and she recognizes when the low mood starts to come because she feels like she wants to withdraw and hide away that's when she'll ring me and sort of you know we make a bit of a plan so it's absolutely manageable and it, she quite honestly is because she's had so much therapy over the years she's probably one of the more emotionally intelligent people that i know yeah I I can relate with that. Uh, I get people that, I guess because I'm a male or something, especially if I'm talking to a female or whatever, they're like, wow, you just seem so emotionally mature. And I'm like, mm, if, yeah. you had, if you had enough time, I can go back and tell you why I'm that mo emotionally mature. <laughs> There's some things in that story yeah, that might exactly. scare you, but <laughs> yes, yeah, I am here yeah. now. <laughs> I learned the hard way. I yeah. learned the hard way why I have to, you know, do it this way instead. And, you know, my, my daughter's just had, um, a little bit of a challenging episode in her work environment because, and it's funny, this is off the back of my new book. So I talk about toxic workplace culture and we tested out her workplace. <laughs> of course, it tests it up as toxic. 80% of workplaces oh, are yeah. toxic. Oh, yeah. Definitely, way. definitely a, um, so a kitchen. 80% of workplaces are toxic? Yep. Oh, my goodness. That's... It doesn't take much, actually. So, you know, as simple as, and there is a, a toxic culture expert from the States whose name is escaping me right now this minute, but she talks about there are 10 questions and if you answer any one of them uh, as a yes, then the, the workplace is toxic. Mm. Now, one of those questions is, have you raised an issue and it's just been ignored or not resolved? Well, I don't know about you, but who hasn't been in a workplace where yeah. they've raised an issue and it's not been resolved. Yeah, I think that yeah, that's going to strike off pretty much. I'm surprised the percentage is not higher after that. Found out that one of the, that was one of the questions. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it just depends on. I mean, the the eighty percent statistic doesn't come from her research. It's actually was other research oh. that I found um, on leadership. But it, you know, I I went back to her assessment where you just ask these ten questions to check if it's toxic. And you know, there there are some pretty significant ones like you know, do people get yelled at or physically hurt, or this is where the trauma kind of comes in. And so, I, I just thought it was fascinating though that you only have to answer yes. And one of one of the questions is, have you raised a problem and it's never been dealt with? And I'm like, who hasn't? Yeah. Like that's just so. That's such an amazing. Um, you know, the screening question, right? Um, you can ask the same I mean, question I, about a I household. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. But you've got to stop and think that workplaces really are just an extension of, you know, the community at large. And we see it in households. We see it, you know, in workplaces. I think you mentioned Alabama's rules mean that they can basically do what they like to you. You don't actually have any rights as an employee necessarily. And I know that that's probably the complexity of the US is that it's different in every state. Um, and that was part of the challenge. But I understood actually that some of your disability laws, because I've spoken to a couple of lawyers in the US, 
some of your disability laws actually come into play when the employer is made aware that there is some level of you know injury so it definitely is applied in terms of physical stuff so if some if the employer knows that you've got a bad back for example it's actually the employer's responsibility to make sure that you have the right chair and the setup at the workplace to make sure that you're not injuring that back any further or they can be held legally liable so and it's an interesting one in terms of the mental health side of things because it's not really an area that we've really tested very much as yet because the pandemic really changed the narrative around the globe about mental health more broadly that many many more people now have what we call mental health literacy an understanding of how we talk about mental health with each other and within the community and the recognition that is what normal right it's becoming more normal oh yeah i mean with the the i mean at the end quote unquote of the pandemic i know i watched the news and you know people were being shut in in their houses in australia and everything and certain parts or certain parts of australia were on total lockdown and other parts of australia were on uh were on um uh, res- kind of moderate yeah, restricted, yeah. yeah, moderate restricted. Uh, yeah. And here in the U.S., there were some people, you know, a majority of people put on masks and everything, and uh, and you had your rebels that didn't. But. Yeah, and then you had your rebels who who didn't. Um, <laughs> and Australia is reasonably compliant, actually, as a country, and I think that's how we we had lockdowns. My daughter was bipolar during COVID. I could not see her for, I didn't see her for nearly a year. Oh, wow. Because we weren't allowed to tra- to travel in between state borders. And my girls live in the other state. I, they don't live in the same state Jeez. as me. And they actually and so followed the rules to, to that. Them for, yeah, well, that's it. And and that's because the, the borders between states were actually policed. So it's not that easy to just go from one to the other. We stopped flying in that first year. So 2020, we didn't have domestic flights for a large portion of it. Um, You know, there was lots of stuff. We we all had to wear masks and do things outside of it. But my daughters both lived in Victoria, which was the state that actually had the longest lockdowns. In the first year, they were locked down for nine months. And in the second year, they were locked down for another three months. Dang. So, you know, (laughs) when you talk about some of the challenges and the bipolar elements and all of that. I can't believe that my daughter at the end of the first year where they were locked down for nine months, that's when she started university. Uh, well, started studying for a pastry chef stuff. She didn't go to university. It was a different kind of school. But she went back then and was had a period of lockdown while she was studying remotely. That was difficult for her to manage, actually. But we all learned how to kind of adapt. But what we've also noticed in Australia is the burnout rate. Um, Lots of people are sort of, we've got this big, you know, everybody talked about the uh, great resignation last year in the US. Um, But I talk about it's only started to happen in Australia now because of our two years of lockdown. We had to wait until you know, the threat of COVID was nothing like what it used to be. And then everybody decided that they wanted to get a job because they associate the difficulties that they had with COVID with the employer that they were working for at the time. Hmm. So there's an element of this where we go, oh, let me change my environment and then I'll feel better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, makes total sense. And we, we do tend to do that. But um, so it's why everybody seems to be doing it at the same time. That caused a lot of trauma. And so with your with your previous book, uh, how how do you prevent trauma how are you how does your book describe preventing trauma so the first book that you're talking about was called the trouble with trauma and i released it in november 2020 because the pandemic stuff just highlighted the fact that i needed to help people to help themselves right and a big part of why i left the psychology profession in australia is also along these lines because i've developed a coaching model of mental health and that's really about 
me providing support and um, maybe some online kind of coaching or, or resource materials and things that help you to actually manage where you're at yourself. And there's lots of different resources that I used to give to people, you know, to do that during my uh, professional life as a psychologist, but I wanted to make it more readily available to lots of people who I may not have ever seen face to face. Under the rules in Australia, I can't do that as a registered psychologist. As a as a registered psychologist, I would have to control everything that went on in that person's kind of experience around mental health. And I went, it's just stupid. We don't have enough. We don't have enough psychologists to actually help. We have less than two and a half thousand registered psychologists in private practice in Australia now for 25 million people. You don't have to do, you don't wow. have to be a genius to do the math to work that one out. That's wild. Um, and it's, yeah, and it's getting less and less. So we needed, we, we really need a shift in the world to help people learn more about how to help themselves. And that's why podcasts like this are really important. Books like I've written are really important because they give people the understanding. Going back to that book, so The Trouble With Trauma actually gives people what I call your self-management system. So it's a framework that I created that actually shows how we manage the different aspects of self that we have. I talk about your parts of self and understanding how they operate. And when we, when we get that clarity around our own personality, we then learn to manage our you know, reactions, our emotional responses much more consistently because we've got greater awareness about what's triggered. So it's a system. And as human beings, we all really have this system in place. It just, it varies slightly, but the system is still there. The minute that we learn really easily how to be in the driver's seat of our own life, then the better off we are. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing over here. Sorry. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's taking notes. I'm sitting here just in, yeah, agreeing with everything that you're saying. I, I, it all lines up with, I mean, it, things that my bipolar didn't become easier for me. I guess that's would be some of the trauma. I did have trauma early on in life and all that too, but daily trauma, I guess, small traumas, my bipolar. And I wasn't able to really, truly manage it. I get manage it like kind of like your daughter until I was aware of everything that was going around. And as long as I was keeping kind of like her, like either keeping physically o occupied or keeping my brain, you know, rather than mindlessly scrolling on Facebook or something, I need to, you know, get on there and play against the computer on chess or something, something just to kind of keep my mind going. Because if I, if I stay too long in my own thoughts, then that's when I start coming up with either bad ideas or things that I don't need to be doing or <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, extreme ideas. And I think that's the, the importance of recognizing it, right, Jeremy? What I talk about is, and this is in the first book, and I touch on it in the last book. So the new book that's just come out in Australia and is in it's available in the US next month. You can buy it online now, pre-order it in the US and it'll be delivered to you. But so in How to Heal a Workplace, I kind of apply the self-management system and how it looks in a workplace. Because if we all understand our own self-management system, we can actually see the different parts show up in the workplace when we interact with others. The whole point about the self-management system is to recognize how you interact with others. But it's also important to recognize how we motivate ourselves internally. And so, you know, I say the goal in, in The Trouble with Trauma, I talk about the fact that the goal is to get clarity and understanding around your rational adult parts of self. Because when we trigger into an emotional reaction, we've either triggered into a child part or a protector part. Now, child parts are the parts that show up in fear. They're scared, they're afraid, they're sad. And protector parts turn up in anger and frustration and external. So the difference between that is the child focuses internally, beating yourself up about the problem, and the protector focuses externally until the protector then turns and attacks the inner child and then you focus internally with the anger. Mm. Now, how do we manage that then? Well, if we can't work out a way how to get the emotions under control, 
we go to our numbing parts. So this is where addictions play in. So our numbing parts kick in. So we drink or we shop too much or we watch porn or we do all of these, you know, we game. We do all of these things to distract our brain because we can't find a solution to the problem. Now, what we want to do is become more aware, more aware of what numbing parts we have, try and minimize the time that we spend in the numb and move more into our rational adult self and find the answer to the problem instead of just avoiding the problem and hiding in the numbness. Jeez, like all um, of that was so, that was the <laughs> easiest, most summarized thing, like most helpful thing, the quickest, most helpful thing right? I think you could say to someone, like the way you described it, the child and the protector. And like the, when you were describing that, I was thinking people at my work about like how easily they are to react emotionally <laughs> to stuff. And I'm like, wow, they are either acting like a child or they're at, they're protecting. And she, that's totally right. Yeah. Well, also with the numbing, like, yep. you, oh yeah, and then just, the numbing thing. You just go into a numbing pattern, and it's like, well, we can either decide to figure out the problem and and fix it, or we can do something to numb the problem and mm -hmm. kind of try to forget about it. And I feel like yep. a lot of people and fall when we're in, in traumatic environments. Yeah. yeah. When we're in traumatic environments, like our childhood home then sometimes we find whatever we can to numb and avoid because we don't have any control about changing it. So that's where our childhood trauma and that's in the, in the trouble with trauma, I do talk about that. And just for listeners, for those of you who don't necessarily want to, you know, read a book because you find it difficult. A lot of people when they've got some mental health challenges find reading quite hard. It is on audio book and it's me that did the audio for that one. So you can buy it on audible. Um, the the best part about that book, I think, was that it was really helping people to understand how their childhood actually affected the way that they've developed into adulthood and gives them a way to understand themselves and, you know, work their way through it. And, you know, sometimes when we label things, it's just much easier for us to then kind of go, okay, now I know what that is instead of just reacting. Yeah. And the four parts that I explained to you about, you know, our, our child and protector and our numbing and our rational, I've since broken down into 12 parts because each, each area of that sh can show up in three main different ways. Then if I talk about your protector parts, you've got your most extreme angry part, but then we've got the assertive part that w is moving, and I talk about this as the assertive parts moving between protector and rational because, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to just fix it this way and I'm just going to get on with stuff, as opposed to passive aggressive, which will move us into numbing. And the passive aggressive is what we do with partners and, you know, some people we work with when we can't change the, the thing they're doing or the way that they're doing it. And it feels like we keep telling them the same thing over and over again. And it's like talking to a brick wall. So then that's passive aggressive. We learned that there's no point in saying anything, but we can't change it. So we go into numbing avoidance. On the flip side with the child, we do the same thing. We have our most withdrawn, um, sad, alone part of us. That's actually, I say, this is our four-year-old self. And there's reasons why I talk about it as being four. But if you just imagine your inner child is your four-year-old self, that's the part that they go, you know, hiding in their room under the bed because nobody loves them, everybody hates them, think they're going to eat worms kind of feeling. And they'll, they'll avoid, they'll keep themselves separate and alone because they feel that that's the only way they can keep themselves safe. When they're moving into a more rational way of thinking, that's when you get the good child. They'll come out and they'll try and do things for others and they'll be super nice and, you know, let me let me do that for you because they're trying to reconnect with the people that, you know, are around them or, or provide support to them. But they do it by being, you know, overly helpful. On, on the child part that goes down in towards numbing, there's still some avoidance. I want you to think about this is a bit more like the depressed part that will spend time doing certain things, but still maintaining a level of social isolation because they feel like they're a burden on others. Wow. Uh... <laughs> and then when we talk... <laughs> I feel called so out a little bit. talk about the addiction, <laughs> right? It helps. It, it, but it helps it, it to does understand, help. really... 
you know, and it makes so much sense. Just going and to that's four where I talk about people. whatever your whatever your addictions are. You know, it doesn't really matter, but we just know and that we know they're there. And you know, when you start pouring a glass of wine or you know the vodka or whatever you're doing, or you start watching porn and you just can't seem to get out of that pattern, you, it pays to stop and think about what happened in the hour before you started. Okay. Because something triggered you. Now, some people will get into a pattern and it can be a pattern that's based on, you know, um, what I lovingly call the three ring, you know, S bleep show of your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if we can swear on here. Oh, oh no, you um, can't. Yeah, yeah, we swear we're... all the time. <laughs> Right. Well, I talk about the three ring shit show of your life. Yeah. So when you can't avoid it, right, how do we how do we manage it? Well, a lot of people will go to their addictions because that's it's a coping mechanism. And, you know, one of the things that happens in the US a lot is people go into, you know, abstinence programs and all of these sorts of things and they're just given just don't do it they're not actually given a whole bunch of understanding about why you feel like you want to do it and let's address the problem at the core. 100% agree. Because addictions are only, right, <laughs> addictions are only the manifestation of the inability to change the problem. Yeah. Uh, and we I'm, focus on... I'm a recovering alcoholic yeah, and exactly. addict, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't go to AA anymore because I basically kind of what you just said, but in a lot more professional sense. And I need to start wording it that way to sound smart. But uh, I quit going like because <laughs> of the chip, the chip system. Like it, it's setting you up for disaster. I mean, you're setting yourself up for failure. And then when say you get five years and you absolutely you know accidentally have a drink, you're that much more devastated that you've let yourself down. And I'm just like, man, if like, like you said, let, why is, what's the reason that I'm drinking and using drugs? Let's figure that out rather than yep. just trying to stay away from it. Like literally just, you know, one day at a time, like that's the, a slogan. It's like, no, I want my entire life. Like, I don't want to have to worry about white yeah. knuckling it until the end of the day. I want to know why I had to white knuckle it. No, because then it's an existence, right? It's not a living life. Exactly. So awesome. the, what you and, and what you've highlighted, I think, is a really important point. Like, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to negate the benefit of you know twelve step programs and things that because there are lots of people for a whole range of reasons that they they have helped. Yeah. Oh yeah. Are, yeah. I, always, I normally follow up with that solution, too. I just didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, yeah. There are a solution that imposes external controls as opposed to building internal ones. Yeah. That's very good to think about external control versus internal control because, you know, we've talked about programs and things like that that give you external control, and this is how you look at it as an internal control thing. Um, that's fantastic. And the thing about trauma is that it's, it's the trigger elements, right? Yeah. So there's something about the early traumatic experiences that trigger a particular feeling but because we've got so good at burying the feeling, we just don't realize that's what we're doing. We just drink or we turn to any other addiction, you yeah. know, drugs or whatever, because I just don't want to feel it. But the, the challenge always in this recovery sort of space, and I do, I talk about mental health recovery, is building the self-awareness to be able to recognize, and I, I talk about a green, like a, a traffic light system, to recognize that when something's happened and you're triggered, and that's where your child or your protector part comes out, and you've had a reaction, then recognizing then what happens about, what, what happens next. If you have more self-awareness, you can build into being more rational and taking a more reasonable approach to the response that you want to take. But at the very beginning, you might still end up having that drink and it might not be until the next morning where you go, hang on, what happened yesterday? Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, at the very beginning of our self-awareness building, we, we can't, we don't anticipate things very well because we haven't spent enough time reflecting on what those triggers were in the first place. So it, it's a learning process. But it's a learning process that you have to take on yourself. No therapist, the therapist might be able to give you some idea about, 
you know, where to look for the answers. And that's really what a therapist will do. But, and they might empower you with validation and all of these other things around your reaction and your experience. But they still can't develop the self-awareness within you. You have to do that yourself. Yeah. And all of this is uh, on your book, in your book, or uh, on Audible? Yeah, in the, in the last... In the last couple of books, but in The Trouble with Trauma, The Trouble with Trauma was really written for individuals, and that's the one that's available on Audible. In that book, I give you the whole rationale for how you got to be this way, um, how you work out what different parts you have, and how you learn to manage that for yourself, the sorts of things that you can do to help yourself. Well, that's awesome. I think yeah, we're going to put a bunch of we're, we're going to put a bunch of bunch of links links and everything for all the books and all that to make sure that people. <laughs> I'm probably going to get the Audible one because I kind of like to read that much. So <laughs> yeah, so uh, we appreciate yeah, exactly. you being on. Um, if you want to share any of your links or socials right here, and uh, we'll do our outro, and um, we'll talk to you after we do our outro. All right, no worries. So most people, if you go looking for me on Facebook, you'll find me at Kerry Howard Psych or on YouTube, it comes up as at the pink shrink. That's fantastic. And I don't do Twitter that much. I, IG, Instagram is also at Kerry Howard Psych. So we can put the links below. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll put the links we'll below. We'll have all that before. So we want to thank uh, Kerry for coming on to the Golden Spoon podcast. Uh, as always, uh, make sure you like and subscribe and uh, go follow everything and go check out Carrie's book. It's available uh, this month because uh, it's March, quote unquote. Yeah, quote yeah. unquote, as we're recording. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, w thank you for listening in. I am McCall. And I'm Jeremy. And we'll talk to y'all next time.